Hola, ¿qué tal? Soy Eva Tobar, mexicana, urgencióloga. Trabajo en el Departamento de Urgencias en Riverside, California. Y tengo un mensaje para mi gente. Esto del coronavirus es una cosa seria, así que si se sienten bien o si lo único que tienen es un poco de dolor de garganta y un poco de mujer, no hay necesidad de, de venir al departamento. Estamos intentando salvar ese recurso para aquellas personas que se sienten más mal y que están más graves, es decir, aquellas que, por ejemplo, tienen dificultad para respirar. Así que es el momento de ser solidarios. Eh, quédate en casa por mí para que yo me quede aquí por ustedes. Fantastic. Um, that was Eva Tova, friend of the show. Uh, tonight we're going to cover a lot of stuff. We're going to be covering uh, some updates from uh, New York, which is still the epicenter of the world right now. We're going to be talking with Dave Talon and Dave Schreiger and uh, a very special guest from UCLA about modeling. Uh, we're going to talk about the covered study that Dave is working on with the CDC. We're going to be talking about low resource settings with uh, Vanessa Cardi. Uh, lots more thoughts on permissive hypoxemia and uh, the critical patient and some cardiology uh, corner stuff. So let me show you a few slides um, as we get into this puppy. So can you see those okay? Swatty? Roger, yes. roger, Excellent. we can indeed. So we're continuing to update the chapter uh, with a significant amount of information I'll get to in a second, but really the big thing this week is that we now have a Spanish language version. Uh, this is starting to move down into Central and South America. And um, we've had multiple requests from many countries that we do this. So this is being translated uh, by our team and we'll probably do an update every week. So you can find it on the, the top of the COVID um, chapter. There is a link there to that. We're gonna try and make that actually even more prominent. Some of the big things we added in the last week is that it's now clear that COVID-19 can also produce altered mental status. It can produce encephalopathy. And apparently uh, this happens with some other viral illnesses as well, like influenza. We've made up a small question sheet uh, set um, that Stuart and the team has been working on. These are now free and up uh, on the site if you wanna use those for your residency training, for example. Uh, we've put a lot more stuff about uh, barriers um, so that you can protect yourself and about some of the, the dynamics of what happens when you have high flow nasal oxygen versus no flow, low, no high flow nasal oxygen with masks and without. And the spoiler alert is if you put a mask over somebody with nasal oxygen or high flow nasal oxygen, it significantly reduces the amount of um, spread. And we put a lot of uh, stuff in about that distancing thing, which a lot of people are anxious about. I'm now going to throw uh, to Swami, who's going to give us the latest updates from the hot zone. Or oh, yours, Swami. Hey, no, thanks. Yeah, so uh, we are still the epicenter, as you said. The prediction is that the cases are going to peak in New York City this week. Uh, a lot of warnings about how bad it's going to be, and everyone's been gearing up for that. Uh, my guess is in Jersey, because we've been a couple of days behind New York all along. So my guess is that we're going to hit that peak couple of days later. So maybe early next week, maybe mid next week. Um, but we are seeing kind of the same things that we've described the last week. It hasn't really tailed off. We're at over 100 vents being used in the hospital. We have a couple of vents that are available. We have extubated some patients, which has been great. We are opening up some new wings and some new beds, which I know a lot of the hospitals in New York have been trying to do as well, trying to find places to move patients out so more patients can come into the department to be seen. I have heard from a couple of colleagues that they're starting to see some of the less sick patients come through. So maybe that's a sign that that huge surge of really sick patients is starting to peter out, but I don't think anyone's ready to get their hopes up at this point. Uh, PPE continues to be very low uh, across the board. There are some places in New York that are hurting worse than where I am. I know a couple of places that have been talking about reusing. So they're not even uh, at the point of one mask per shift. It's one mask per a couple of days. Uh, I know some friends have been using UVC to clean the masks, heating to clean the masks. So different approaches to doing this. If anyone is looking to donate PPE, there is a great site, um, which is getuspppe.org, where you can actually go on and you can give PPE to different places or you can donate money to help them run that organization. It's a, a great organization doing fantastic work. 
we are, um, and when I say we, I mean across the board, New York, New Jersey, we are very low on vents, CPAP machines, high flow nasal cannula. We've been using a lot of makeshift CPAP devices. So kind of constructing CPAP from some of the other things that we have lying around so that we can give patients some kind of respiratory support. And Mel, I know you mentioned about the amount of aerosolization of particles. And this is one of the amazing things that I've seen with this pandemic, this epidemic in our area over the last week is how quickly we shift in management. So two weeks ago, we were telling people, don't use high flow nasal cannula, don't use CPAP because of the potential to aerosolize and get all of the staff sick. Now we're saying almost exactly the opposite. Use CPAP, use high flow nasal cannula, but we are all protecting ourselves. We are in airborne precautions for our entire shift, but we also understand that the only way to keep patients off of vents is to use some positive pressure. So CPAP and uh, high flow nasal cannula are allowing us to not use ventilators. The caveat or the downside to that, of course, is the exposure risk. And so we don't walk around without an N95 mask on, without face protection on at all times in order to prevent our staff from getting ill. So that's the trade-off that we've seen. I think when you have low COVID numbers, it's okay to say we're not going to use CPAP and high-flow nasal cannula, or we're only going to use those negative pressure rooms. As the penetrance of COVID gets higher and higher, then you start shifting where your resources have to go and, and how you look at these things. Um, that aerosolization issue, we've get, gotten a lot of questions through MRAP about that. And so I think you just need to protect yourself if you're going to be doing it. If you have unlimited negative pressure rooms, which none of us do, that's obviously the ideal. It just doesn't work most of the time. We are using some new ventilation strategies, and I'm going to leave a little bit of that to Sarah to talk about later on. Uh, but we are using higher FiO2s with lower peeps, so not really that ARDSnet protocol. And we've seen a lot of benefit from that. We're using proning a lot. And it's not just either patient lying on back or patient lying on front. We're using some varied proning. So we're doing some left lateral recumbent. We're doing some right lateral uh, recumbent position. I'm often having the patients sit up in a chair because they often feel fairly comfortable about that. So we'll let them sit in a chair for part of the time and shifting back and forth between all of these different positions. Uh, Scott has, Scott Weingart put together a nice little infographic on how to do this, but the, the idea is we're gonna ask them to reposition themselves and then see how they feel. If they don't feel comfortable, then reposition themselves in another spot and see what works for the individual patient. I think all of these things are really important. The uh, last thing that I wanna leave people with is our intubation process has also shifted. So in addition to all of the things that we were doing to protect ourselves, we're also trying not to don and doff as many times. And what we're finding is that many of these patients, when they get intubated, they're having hemodynamic instability. And so we're then leaving the room, doffing, getting our A-line kits and our CVL kits, coming back in, having to don again and then doff again. So to avoid that, we're going into every intubation with central line and arterial line kits. The nurses are doing the art line setups before we go into the room to do the tube so that we can do everything all at once. Uh, we're saving some PPE that way, but also saving the process of doffing and donning an extra time. And we are trying to put most of those lines in the femoral site. So CVL and A-line in the femoral vessels. And the reason for that is these patients do not tolerate pneumothoraces very well. And we've seen a couple pneumothoraces in our patients. And that's obviously going to be more exposure for the staff because now we got to go in and put a chest tube, but also really bad for the patient. So we've started doing more lines in the groin. And then Mel, I just wanted to say one last thing. I know a lot of people have reached out to me to ask about updates. Um, about a month ago, one of the docs in our place at St. Joe's went into critical care with COVID-19. He was intubated for two weeks. This is uh, Jim Pruden. Um, this is all uh, public information. Uh, he released all of the information to ASEP. ASEP sent out some newsletters about it. Uh, Jim was intubated about a month ago. He was extubated about two weeks ago, but then was re-intubated. And uh, as of today, Jim is on just a couple liters of nasal cannula. He is doing great. They are trying to get him to a, a rehab center soon. He's obviously very weak from being in the ICU for a month and being on and off of mechanical ventilation, but he is neurologically intact. He is doing really well. And uh, he wanted just to let everybody know that he is doing well and he hopes that uh, he'll be talking to people soon, but we're really happy to see him really turning around. And uh, Mel, that's the update from my side of the world. That is... Uh... That's great news that there is light at the end of the tunnel um, for some of these patients and uh, for a colleague that makes us feel 
uh, a lot better. So thanks, uh, Swami. Um, how are you, how are you doing, and how sort of the community there doing? Are they just are you guys just exhausted? I think we're pretty tired out. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I think the news of uh, Dr. Pruden turning around in the last couple of days has been a huge. Uh, lift up for not just the docs and the nurses, but also the community where I work, because he is a very well-known figure in that community. And I think that that is a really positive message for us to be sending out and letting people know. I think that's really reinvigorated a lot of folks, um, but it is exhausting. Now, you know, working a 12-hour shift is exhausting enough. Working a 12-hour shift in an N95 is brutal. Um, you get short of breath, and there are times where we start thinking, oh my God, maybe I'm getting it because I'm so short of breath from being in an N95. And we're trying as much as we can to rotate people out. And this is something that, you know, people who are just getting into the surge should think about. Uh, 12 hours, eight hours in an N95 is is these were not designed for us to be in for eight or 12 hours. So make sure that you're covering each other, giving each other breaks in some kind of a warm zone where they can get out of that N95 mask, get some fresh air, maybe go outside and get a little bit of fresh air and some sun. It's really, really important. We're, you can't eat, you can't drink. People are getting dehydrated. So we really need to be careful about taking care of each other, make sure everyone's getting some breaks, but it is exhausting, Mel. We are really hoping that this, this surge coming to a peak in the next week is really what we're going to see. And then we can start seeing us going back down. Uh, I think this is a really hard thing to maintain for such a long period of time. Fortunately, we are seeing some docs from other parts of the country and some nurses from other parts of the country come in flooding into New York and our area to um, relieve us and help give us uh, some support. And I'm hoping that as we start to to peter off, we can lend that expertise as well. So we can come and reach out to other communities who are starting to hit that surge and uh, come and help as much as we can. Yeah, it's been impressive here in California. They put the call out for retired docs and nurses and uh, 87,000 so far have signed up to help out if needed. Um, I think it's great. We obviously don't want to rush in there yet because we need to sort of flatten the curve for the docs and the nurses as well. Um, and then also if we don't need to go in, um, you know, me intubating, uh, since I haven't done one in about four years, it's not going to be pretty, let me tell you. But I'll do it, but it's not going to be pretty. Let me show you another video if I can make this puppy work. Um, it's about flattening the curve, and it's with a purpose because we've got an expert about this stuff coming up. I've heard the term flattening the curve, but what does it mean? Well, if you have a virus that's very infectious and you just let it run its normal course, then a lot of people get sick in a short period of time. And that can overwhelm the healthcare system if a significant percent of those people get sick, as with this current coronavirus. But if you do things like social distancing, then you can reduce the rate of spread of the virus. So at any one point in time, there's not so many people sick. So you're less likely to overwhelm that healthcare capacity. Eventually, Maybe the same number of people are going to get infected, but instead of it occurring over a few months, it occurs over many months. In addition, this extending the period of time over which people are getting infected means that there might be time to develop vaccines or antiviral therapies that could be given to more people than otherwise would occur. So flattening the curve, spreading out the patient load, essentially gives healthcare workers more time. And that is ultimately what's going to save lives. So um, that's one of the sort of public service announcement things we've been doing. Um, I want to bring in Dave Schrager now because Dave has um, a friend, which is amazing um, that he has a friend. But before you go there, this is the sort of thing that I've been looking at a lot. This is out of, uh, I think, Washington. We've been watching these curves and looking at these curves. But then I sort of realized I, I don't really understand these curves. <laughs> Um, I thought I did, but I don't think I really know. So Dave, can you introduce us to a very special guest tonight and uh, get us educated? Absolutely. Um, and so the point that Mel just made, which is we know how to read a randomized trial and critique it. We know how to read a study about diagnostic tests and critique it. But most of us don't have a whole lot of experience critiquing models that attempt to forecast an epidemic. And so the purpose of the segment is to educate us a bit about how to read these critically. So when we read the model, which you just showed, uh, can we believe it? What are the assumptions it's making? In what ways is it likely to be wrong? Is it likely to be biased high or low? Those are the questions we would normally ask about any study. And these are no obsession, exceptions. So to do that, I'm honored to bring on Andrea Bertozzi. Andrea is the Betsy Woodnap Chair for Innovation and Creativity 
and the Distinguished Professor of Mathematics and Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering at UCLA and Director of Applied Mathematics there. And she's first going to give us a little primer on the modeling that goes on in forecasting epidemics. Andrea? Thank you, Dave. So let me just switch here. Can you all see the presentation? Can. Great. OK, so that's working. OK, it great. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to review some basics on epidemic modeling. And I'm going to explain kind of the mechanics that go into these models. So um, the model I'm going to re review is a well-known, um, almost classic textbook epidemic model called the SIR model. Um, SIR is an acronym. It stands for Susceptible, Infectious, and Recovered. And basically what you do is you take your population and you put it into compartments. It's called a compartmental model. So you're either an, a susceptible person, an infectious person, or you're recovered. And then there are uh, transmission rates that will take you from one category to the next. So to go from susceptible to infectious, that's a process that mechanically involves one person who's susceptible coming into contact with someone who's infectious and then having the disease transfer to them. Um, that transfer happens with a transmission rate, um, which we call beta, um, but, but that rate is also proportional to the number of susceptible uh, people and the number of infectious people, so it's a product here. Um, now going from the infectious category to recovered, it's just a straight decay, um, and that is a function of the recovery rate gamma. So there are two um, time constants in this model, beta and gamma. So we can write this down as a differential equation. I'm not going to go too much into the details of the math. In case you're interested, the equations are down here. Um, and the most important number in all of this is what's called the reproduction number. It's a dimensionless number, R0. You've probably heard people talking about R0. That's basically the ratio of these two time constants, beta over gamma. And then this is how the disease progresses. You'll start, so with a disease like COVID-19, we um, have some belief that um, the population has no immunity starting at the, the initial time, although that, of course, is something that's still questionable. But for this model, we're going to assume we have no immunity, um, and um, we're going to look at what happens. So the, the blue curve is a curve. This is time on, that, on the x-axis, and the blue curve is describing the percentage of the population that is susceptible. And as they start getting infected, the green curve, which is your infected population, starts to increase. And this is what you're all measuring right now, right? So that's what causes people to go into the hospital, to be put on ventilators. And you're all interested in when this peak is going to happen. That's where you have the maximum number of infected people. And while this is happening, people are also recovering. So this, this red curve shoots up. And then as you go to the very end of the epidemic, you end up with a population that has quite a large percentage of the population recovered, um, now possibly immune to the virus, the infecteds go to, to zero, um, but also your susceptible population peters out too. So one question you might ask is, um, do these end state population fractions, um, how do they depend on r not? And so there's a well-known formula for that. So, um, so there's actually two relevant curves here. So on the y-axis is the proportion of the population that has become infected at some time. Um, and on the x-axis is R0. Um, and so R0 bigger than one is, is where you're gonna see an epidemic. If R0 is somehow less than one, um, then you won't see the epidemic progress. So let me remind you, r naught's the ratio of those two constants, transmission rate divided by recovery rate. So the transmission rate is something we can control with distancing measures. So we can ask people to stay home, wear masks, that will slow the transmission of the virus. The recovery rate is basically inherent to how people recover. It's the time scale people take to recover from the virus. So what you see here is, um, so there's something that you've heard of called herd immunity. If you have, a, for a fixed R0, there is a certain fraction of the population, and that's shown in um, red. Sorry, my slides are flipping around here. There we go. So that's, that's the red curve, which I have the cursor on right now. So um, that red curve describes the 
minimal fraction of the population that you need to have herd immunity. That doesn't mean that you're going to have precisely that fraction when the epidemic goes through the population, quite to the contrary. So if you just let the epidemic go through the population uncontrolled, that's the blue curve. That's what you're gonna end up with at the end. And if we look at a time series of what that looks like, this is sort of the apocalyptic scenario. So um, on the right hand plot, we show the weeks and the, um, the infection incidence on the, uh, um, that's, uh, that's the infection incidence per 100,000 population. Um, and what you see is that with no controls, and this is uh, an example with R naught equals two, this is from a paper that came out in PNAS um, in 2007, um, you see that, um, that with no controls, with R naught equals two, um, you're expected to have 80% of your population infected, which is huge. Um, now, there's an optimal control that you can try to find, but that's hard to do in practice, where you just have 50% of the population infected over a longer time scale. But if you get, um, if, you, if you're a little too effective, let's say you flatten the curve too much, and then you um, release your social distancing measures rather quickly, you'll see another peak happen. So those are the kinds of dynamics that we expect to see with, with, um, with this basic model, and we expect to see it in real life. Um, so here's another plot that I can show you. This is an important one. This shows you um, for different values of R0, um, what is the, the uh, fraction of the population who will be um, still susceptible at the peak of your infection. And you can see that as R0 gets larger, so here's 4.8, which is a big number. Um, we're talking about 80% of the population already having caught that disease. So that's, um, that's, kind of, that, that's a big number. Um, so that's, that's a takeaway that we have from this plot. Uh, the peak number of infection, infections happens when the percent susceptible is exactly one over R0. So for even moderate size R0 bigger than, than one, this means a large fraction of the population will have been exposed and infected at the peak. Um, so at the end of the epidemic, the percent that's unaffected can be modest. To avoid this, we can do physical distancing, um, ideally to get the R not quite small, which can bide us time, as was just shown in the previous video, for example, for a vaccine to be um, available or some medical interventions that could slow morbidity and mortality. Okay, so here's another plot. Um, so if you wanna try to fit data, to a model like SIR, it's a little tricky. Um, but there are some things that we know. So one thing that we know is if we do know R0, which is, a, again, a little hard to estimate, there's actually a unique solution once you rescale a few things. So we can rescale time by the recovery rate, rate gamma. And then there's an, just a fixed, unique curve that all of these different um, populations collapse onto with that time scale. There is one detail, which is that the curve shift in time, which you can see on this inset, depending on the fraction of the population that's infected at the initial time. So that determines the time to the peak infections here. And so that, um, trying to estimate information in this precursor tail is very, very difficult. And that's basically what epidemiologists have been trying to do. Okay, so another thing we can do is we can try to measure R0 as it changes in time. And so this is something that I've been working on with some collaborators. Um, and we use a um, self-exciting Hox process model. It's a stochastic process uh, model that has a background Poisson arrival rate and then an excitation, which basically is designed to model an epidemic. So one of the things we can do is calculate from the data what the dynamic R0 is. And that's, of course, today a very important thing to measure because we know that different countries are introducing population measures that will try to bring R0 down. And so you can see that in the data from China going all the way back into January where R0 was up in the high twos and had slowly you know, decayed over time as distancing measures were put into place. The same thing can be seen in the data from Italy, and now we're analyzing the US data and some early data from some of the cities. So I'm gonna stop there and thank you all for listening. Well, thank you, Andrea. The, and I think if you unshare your screen at this point, yeah. Yes. 
Great. Um, so thank you for that. So I guess I have a couple questions for you. Um, the models that the, the mill showed earlier, the ones um, from Seattle, from the University of Washington, are they based on this RSI or are they using a different That's model? a good question. That's right. So my understanding is the Washington model is based on curve fitting. So they have, a, they have sort of a standard error function type curve um, that has kind of a shape that might look like some of the prior outbreaks. And they're trying to see if they can collapse data from different locations onto that curve. But um, it's different from the kind of model that I presented. Um, the model that I presented is probably the simplest one that you can write down that involves the mechanics of people coming into contact with each other and getting infected. Um, there's a, a study that was put out that made a huge impact in the United States and in the UK just a few weeks ago, and that was the study from Imperial College with Neil Ferguson as the lead author. So that study um, uses a much more sophisticated model than the one I presented, but it does use the same kind of contact dynamics that I described. Right. And at the bottom of the, um, of the Seattle site, uh, it says that at the end of this, they're projecting that only somewhat less than 10% of the population, and maybe even less than 5%, will be immune. And, and I think, you know, what's concerning to some of us is, um, if we successfully get through this first wave, but we do it in a way where social distancing has muted the R naught and muted the RT, so that um, we're not getting huge numbers of people infected, uh, that will leave us with a population which is fundamentally still susceptible. So then if you release the social distancing and there are still cases extant in the community, you better be very re ready to shift back to a mode of case identification and sequestration and finding all the contacts, or it's just going to blow up again and we're going to be in round two. And round two won't be very different than round one because we have... Um, so much of the population is still susceptible to the infection. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. So there is one detail that I want to mention, which is that the SIR model is a, is a complete mixture model. It assumes that everyone is in contact with everyone else at the same rate. And that's certainly not the case. So we know right now that there are people that have, you know, special conditions or they're very old and they've been told really to stay out of contact with almost everybody. So hopefully these people will, will stay away from contracting the virus and they may have to live like that for quite some time. Um, so it is a little difficult to try to estimate, you know, what the effect of R0 is for a heterogeneous population, right? Um, so there are a lot of details and there are a lot of models floating around that I've seen. There's one that came out of Spain recently that was, uh, that was done um, to try to model the different cities in Spain and to try to provide some help to the government of Spain. So quite, quite a lot of interesting models floating around, many with the same mechanics that I described today. Dave, you're on mute. No, not working. Well, let me ask a question while uh, Dave uh, plays with that for a second. Um, so social distancing changes your R0 um, and you can squash the curve a lot, but if you squash it too much, everybody is still at risk. So that has obviously profound implications, but the thing I don't understand, how did China squish it to zero and apparently keep it at zero? Well, I think we have to see about that because they're just now starting to open up things. And there are very likely people still infected with this disease in China. So we just have to see what happens there. I mean, the same thing with Japan and Korea, They've, they all have their own ways of trying to manage the disease. And so we have to see, I think this is, we're, we're wading into an unknown here. I mean, we haven't seen something like this worldwide since the 1918 influenza. So, and of course our lifestyles are quite different today. In, in all respects from 1918. Right, um, so Dave, I don't know, just give us a test, see if you can. I think I'm back. Yep, continue on. I think my headphones failed me, they ran out of power. So in any case, um, I think the most academically honest thing to say right now is as much as we'd like to believe that social distancing has worked and for uh, on the West Coast say, um, this is gonna be manageable, uh, we don't really know that and we really don't know um, whether we are just at the beginning of a first servo or something which is going to continue to build till ultimately the whole population is, is immune, um, meaning that everyone either has it or a vaccine 
miraculously arrives and we can all take, but that's some time off, obviously. So, um, you know, I think we all have to steel ourselves that we're in this for the long haul and there's no guarantee that just because the peak in New York may be a few days away and in other parts of the country a, a little bit longer away, that doesn't mean we're done. And so I think everybody needs to be planning to be taking care of this for a long time. Is that, is that a fair message, Andrea? It is. And there's one more thing I wanted, one detail I wanted to add, which is a lot of people are looking at data for new infections every day. And you have to be a little bit careful because when you, when you see that number start to go down, you're actually looking at the inflection point on the infection curve. You're not actually looking at the peak. So you're about, you know, you're on the order of halfway up to the peak when you start to see that number go down. So just, just brace yourselves and be aware that, you know, we have, we're in this for the long haul. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Hey, Andrea, may, Andrea, may I ask you a question? Sure. All right. <laughs> so this is Dave. I, I found your presentation fascinating. So tell me uh, in your modeling, uh, how you take into account or consider the possibility that viruses tend to be seasonal. So, right, right influenza doesn't like the um, warm weather, right? And it's seasonal. Most other coronaviruses are seasonal. And then I want to ask you one more thing, which is uh, the previous dangerous coronavirus, SARS, was captured, was eliminated. Right. Um, it, it died out in the last patients. And then um, uh, you'll have to tell me, maybe they, the Chinese felt that they had tracked the or, animal origin of this to these civets, right? Right, Cats. right. That's right. And then they mass annihilated them and removed them from the face of the yeah. earth. But well, we yeah. But haven't, we, haven't we haven't seen SARS again for over 15 years. So explain how that happens. Well, I mean, here's the thing with a with a pan, with any pandemic. I mean, what, I mean, okay. So first of all, SARS never became a pandemic, right? There were there were isolated outbreaks, and if you can keep it at the level of isolated outbreaks and isolate all the patients and just let them recover, then it's gone. I mean, the virus has absolutely you know it's gone. There's there's no if if you if you eliminate all the active virus particles, there's it's gone. It's done. Um, so there's another virus, of course, that has some similarity to this, which is MERS, right? Right. Right. And so MERS is a, is a different story because it's still active and you've got, you've got it active also in the camel population, right? And so MERS, MERS um, is going to be around, but it's, it also affects people in a different way. I mean, in terms of, um, you know, death rates, in terms of contagious, contagiousness. Um, so... Uh, you know, these viruses are very um, subtle in some sense, right? They all have uh, some different properties. Now, as far as the summer goes, from the, from the modeling standpoint, um, there's going to be some new data, of course, coming out in the summer, and we're going to want to look at that really closely. We're going to want to understand how the transmission rate changes in the summertime, um, depending on location. I mean, in the United States, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens in the deep south, right, versus, say, Seattle, versus the desert area, right? It's going to be really interesting to see those numbers. And I mean, already, it would, yeah. It would be I, wonderful if we got a reprieve with the summertime coming and time for to develop a vaccine. It sure would. It absolutely sure would. So, you know, like I said, this is a new thing. I think we're all trying to estimate it. Um, for the most part, we're still um, at the early stages. And I think New York's going to be the place that we all have our eyes on for the next few weeks. Andrew, well, thank you so much for that. And, and perhaps we can have you back in a few weeks and see where all this is going. Yeah, it's an exciting problem to work on. Not, not, the, not the funnest thing I've worked on. It's, it's pretty stressful, but um, very exciting to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Yeah, thank you for coming. It's really useful information. I feel a bit more empowered now about this stuff. Now, it's interesting, this should segue well if I pull up my slides here. In the last week, there's been a couple more papers about um, testing. And I think testing is going to become very important once we get over the other part, side of this curve for reasons that we talked about. So there's, it turns out that not all the PCRs are created equal. And there's also more stuff about the IgM and IgG tests. So, um, Dave, I'm going to sort of t 
turf it back to you again. Um, obviously, this testing, after we get past this top of the curve, is going to be how we keep the curve crushed. Is it? Am I understanding it right? So you go from um, testing because you want to know who's got the disease to where Swami is. You don't need to test. Everybody's got the disease. To we've crushed the curve. We want to let people back to work. We're going to have to do testing, and it's going to be the IgM IgG, right? Um, I think IgM IgG will be part of that. Um, when will we know this is over? Well, first we'll see that our emergency departments aren't full of COVID patients and our ICUs aren't full of patients on ventilators. And we'll start to see those patients coming to the hospital less and less. And then the question becomes, um, as Andrea was talking about, um, when can we release social distancing measures. And for that, we'll need something much more sensitive to understand where that disease is in the community. We actually have existing uh, surveillance for influenza that looks at exactly that so that we can track the onset of influenza and when influenza leaves communities. So I'm gonna show you a couple slides. Let me try to share these. Uh, let's see, hopefully you can see this. And, and so when we stop, can everybody see this now? Yep, we're seeing it. All right, good. All right. So when we stop seeing cases come into the hospital, very sick cases, we'll know that, you know, most, most of the worst is over. But then the question is, to what extent does the disease still exist in the community such that we should have a, a strategy of containment and social distancing? And then we'll have to shift to a, instead of the canary in the coal mine, sort of surveillance that exists now and, and limited availability of testing, we, we hope to move to a stage where testing will be very available and we can look at people who come in from the community with more mild disease. And so this slide shows actually where this was done, to look for the community presence of COVID-19 in, in patients coming to urgent cares and emergency departments with mild influenza-like illness. Uh, it was done actually at your old place, uh, USC. Stu, are you still there? I am indeed. Okay, well, this was, this was done right at your place. And, and this is the very first time in the United States someone attempted to, uh, to measure community prevalence of COVID in people with mild influenza-like illness. So between March 12th and 16th of this year, 131 consecutive patients coming in with mild respiratory symptoms and fever um, were seen at, this, at these clinics, and every single one had testing for influenza, RSV, and COVID-19. And what they found was at that time, which is about a little bit over two weeks ago, or about two and a half years COVID time, I guess. Uh, they found 5% of those patients had COVID, but interestingly, they found none of the patients had influenza or RSV. So remember, that's in the middle of March. And if you look at those graphs that I have on that slide, you'll see the, the one on your left shows you um, the proportion of flu tests that are positive, and you can see that when the flu season started, and I think we've all forgotten how busy the emergency departments were um, late last year, uh, the number of the proportion of flu tests increased, and then recently ha has really decreased. And in this study, they found no influenza. Um, we also have surveillance for for the syndrome of influenza-like illness, and um, on the next slide, you can see there's a seasonal peak starts in the fall, peaks January and February, then comes down. Well, for this year, that's the line that's shown in, in gray. And you see I put a little arrow there. You see how it was starting to come down like every other season. But then there's this inflection point where it's shooting up. So this is the pandemic reaching um, the community as reflected by our current surveillance uh, for in influenza. So you might go, well, OK. 5% had COVID, none of them had influenza, none of them had RSV. So what was causing their illness? Well, there's other respiratory viruses. Uh, this is a study from the Stanford Emergency Department where they did multiplex PCR for respiratory uh, viral pathogens. Um, and you can see that um, 
again, this is about the same period in mid-March that common viruses, rhinovirus, respiratory enteroviruses, uh, metanumovirus, many other respiratory viruses besides influenza and RSV contribute to all the patients who have these syndromes. But um, until we have a good diagnostic test, we won't know which ones have COVID-19. At Stanford, they also uh, reported how often they, they saw co-infection. Uh, and one strategy, I think, at the beginning of this pandemic, uh, especially when COVID tests weren't available, was to test for influenza or, or do the full respiratory panel and then presume that it, if influenza was found that the person couldn't have COVID. Well, as you can see in this slide, about 20% of the patients who were COVID positive also had PCR detection of other types of respiratory viruses. And of course, as there's more and more cases in the community, the proportion of cases that are COVID and might also have another virus is only going to go up. So this is not a strategy that um, uh, can be used with much accuracy to rule out uh, COVID infection. When we have broad availability of testing and communities are tested on a systematic basis and we stop seeing COVID in mildly symptomatic individuals, then I think we'll start talking about releasing social distancing. And then the last thing, Mel, you brought up uh, serology. So an another type of uh, research that you're going to see in the next few weeks, I think, is you're going to see communities, uh, populations tested uh, systematically to detect IgM and IgG. IgG would mean that the patient IgG and IgM and IgG would signify that the patient had a previous infection. So we'll get an idea of the epidemiology of the disease, the attack rates, the case fatality rate with the true denominator. And then the other thing we'll be able to, to understand is the proportion of all cases um, that are represented by people who had, who had no symptoms at all. So they were asymptomatic with infection. And we'll understand where those groups reside for example, it's been suggested that maybe children you know, are sort of the reservoir for this infection in adults. So we'll, we'll have a much better understanding of that as you start to see what are called seroprevalence studies. So uh, Stuart has a question for you. Dave, can you just unsh unshare your screen? Yeah, so my, my question is, um, as a non-immunologist, Dave, how do we know when the IgG antibodies are protective and when they're not, isn't it hard to tell in any given disease what, what the significance of that is? Yeah, I don't, I, don't think, I don't think we know. And in fact, there was a very good review, it just came out in JAMA, it was sort of a synopsis of many of the issues that you know, we've discussed here on MRAP over the last few weeks. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that they, their conclusions are pretty much the same as our conclusions in these discussions. Um, they do address that and they say, well, there have been some reports of patients um, in other countries where they seem to have had a primary COVID illness and then um, uh, had testing that seemed to show that they had either persistence of infection or recurrent infection. Um, and they said, well, that it's not really clear if they just had persistence of PCR, sort of viral dust that was detected and had another respiratory viral infection not caused by COVID. The presumption is, from what we know of other viral infections, including uh, uh, coronavirus infections, is that IgG does, does represent um, uh, protective immunity, does signify protective immunity. Uh, but but as, with, as we discussed before, with many infections, that protective immunity is not lifelong. But for, for what has been observed in coronavirus infections, it typically lasts a year or two. So um, let's hope that's true with uh, COVID-19. And let's hope that that uh, it allows us, again, a little bit more time to see therapeutics and a vaccine uh, be available. I think Sean uh, Nort has a question for you. I have a comment, Dave, just to see if you agree, because uh, convalescent Plasma seemed to have worked for SARS, has worked for a lot of other things, and that's IgG, and it has to be 
uh, to a certain uh, tighter ratio for that to be beneficial. So my suspicion is IgG would be uh, protective for those people. And it looks like to my uh, reading, the SARS people even had IgG measured out to four. I think the latest one is maybe six years, but of course it's going to wane probably in a lot of people. But I would suspect it's a leap, but if you have a high enough IgG, you probably are somewhat protected. Would you agree? Uh, yeah, I think that's what most people presume. All right, um, Dave, tell us about the covered study that you are working on with the CDC. Okay, sure. So, you know, if I would ask you, what is the most important question to try to answer for emergency providers? I, I think many of you would say, I would like to know what is my risk of acquiring COVID-19 infection by doing my work? And, um, and then how, how could I, what could I do to reduce that risk? And so we, we talk about the risk of acquiring COVID-19, but we don't really, we don't, we don't know what that risk is. And so um, the Centers for Disease Control um, asked our group to answer that question. And so the name of the study is called the COVID um, Evaluation of Risk for emergency departments. And altogether, if you underline the right letters in that, it spells covered, like we got you covered. And we got you covered because if, if we can pull off this research project, at the end of it, we will understand what the incremental risk is of doing our job compared to just being a person out in the community. And we hopefully will have some good clues as to how to reduce that risk. Now, I, I'm pleased to say that the CDC, which is a, you know, part of the federal government, has made this their highest priority. Uh, people really appreciate emergency physicians, nurses, EMS personnel going out and doing their job. And um, you know, you, you've seen that in the media. And, and I think there is a feeling that you know, perhaps um, you know, some of our institutions let us down by not allowing us to be as prepared as we might be and have personal protective equipment available and other things that help us take care of patients. So this is the CDC's, one of the CDC's highest priorities to try to understand that. So they asked our group, and you know our group, uh, Greg Moran and Bill Maurer, Anusha Krishnadasan, and our emergency ID net network that has existed for 25 years, um, along with collaborators at my, at my, with my new friends at the University of Iowa, Nick Moore and Brett Faney and Kerry Harlan, to try to put this together very quickly because of course the, epi the pandemic is, is here now and it's progressing and those curves tend to suggest that this will be something that we can study and we should study right at the moment and for the next few weeks, but we're not sure, um, you know, we hope that the uh, pandemic wanes soon. So we really have to get going. It's a hard study. There is funding that the, that the CDC has pledged to us quite a bit to get this done. And uh, with the help of our emergency ID net network and the near um, airway network, uh, we're hoping among those hospitals, we'll have sites that despite being very, very busy, overwhelmed with patient care, that they can carve out a little time to do this research so that we can then report back to everybody here, you know, what was the risk that you took on to do your job to take care of people? And then what have we learned so that for the next time we're that much safer? Yeah, it's pretty um, fundamentally important stuff. So thanks Dave for throwing that together at the last second with the CDC. <laughs> nice work. Well, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm worried that we can do it um, we, because it is a short amount of time and research projects generally, you know, take, take months to go, hold on a second. <laughs> My phone is talking. I should have turned it off. <laughs> Sorry. Who's calling me? The CDC. The CDC. Yeah, the CDC. <laughs> Turn this thing off. Anyhow, what did you ask me? <laughs> no, I was just saying good work. And uh, it usually takes months, you were saying, but you've got yeah, to put this together yeah. in weeks. 
Yeah, I mean, re research projects, big research projects take a long time. They get slowed down at the institutions by IRBs that meet every month. And, you know, some nerd who, you know, finds one of the lowercase j's isn't dotted uh, and lawyers looking over contracts. So um, I'm hoping that this being a, a real national priority, um, that a lot of those usual hurdles that slow things down uh, will be cleared out of the way so we can get going. And and uh, anyone that's listening to this who might be interested in participating, particularly, um, you know, if you're in any of the hospital network uh, networks that I mentioned, you know, please get in touch with me. Great. Um, let's move on to talk about therapeutics. And um, I think Stuart is going to take us through this with Sean Nort and with Dave Tellen. So... Alrighty. So uh, the uh, thanks, Mel. And I think that's, you know, it's pretty huge uh, what what Dave's doing. And so I wonder if that's if we can use that information, Dave, to uh, get some uh, hazard pay for some of our staff. I wonder if we can make that uh, proportional to the uh, risk that you discover. Uh, but anyway, um, we just wanted, Sean and I just wanted to cover a few things briefly. The first thing that uh, we heard coming out of New York was that there are, are now shortages of some of the, uh, go back to that one, Mel, shortages of some of the um, uh, drugs used for analgesia and sedation in the ICU, which of course was inevitable. And I just want everyone to know that uh, the team has gone through uh, and produced uh, a table. It's peer reviewed. We've had everyone look at it. We've had Scott look at it uh, and uh, uh, Sean has reviewed it. So this is a, uh, alternative doses that you can use, and that can be linked directly through the chapter. So that's that. And then this next uh, slide is basically uh, a shout out for Monash, which as you know, Monash uh, University, uh, the finest medical school. That's because Mel, Mel went there. Um, and uh, they, uh, they just came out with a study that shows this in vitro action of ivermectin and so that's that was big news so just to put that into perspective uh if you can show us the uh the next slide we have the breakdown of where ivermectin has been used and you can see it's been used in a ton of different uh, environments this is an anti-helminthic of course it's been around forever but it's also an antiviral um and we can see the list of the uh the sense and anti-sense rna vi viruses that it's been worked with but this is this is all in vitro this is all in vitro. And in fact, there's some of the sense viruses where it's not even, uh, it, the, the data's mixed. It's not even working in that respect. But the overall uh, most important thing here uh, is to recognize that we're going to have to take a huge leap from the assumption that all these studies that are showing a decrease in viral load or whatever other surrogate marker they happen to be using and whether or not it's going to translate into clinical be benefit. And so I think that's still the main, uh, the main problem. But Sean, uh, you think of ivermectin a little bit differently than hydrochloroquine, don't you? Because it might be a bit of a safer shot if it works. Is that, is that your impression? Well, yeah. And let me just say a few positive things. You know, uh, that SIR model, as you heard, is a standard model, but uh, tons of people now learning that and are not. And we're all going to come out stronger at the other end with all this knowledge that people are getting. And this really is, to me, is the way that uh, compounds come to market. We're just going through a bunch of what we call lead compounds that you're saying, which one is bench to bedside can we be looking at? So you see ivermectin, tons of viruses it's been looked at. It's a completely different mechanism, of course, than what it's used as an antiparasitic. Uh, so there's a lot of data out there doesn't seem to translate that well to clinical, but why I do think that it's worth at least taking a look at in a true randomized controlled trial is it's got such a great safety profile and it's widely available and it would most likely be a single dose that you would try in this study. So if we can bring up the, the slide, uh, the next slide, the diagram. The two-step, we call it the two-step. You seeing that? Not, Not yet. yet. Not yet. Come on. Wait, wait for it. Wait ah, for it. It's there. We got okay, it. Okay, there you go. Okay, so if we look at this, what we're calling the antiviral two-step, if I'm going to focus you on the right side where remdesivir is, and that's being studied right now, and a lot of people listening to this are part of the trials, that the way rem, uh, remdesivir works is it impairs this uh, RDRP, which is necessary for the virus to continue to make particles. So that's one point. The ivermectin, and these are all from the in vitro data, but what it does is that it 
it affects this important. And what important is, is a protein that transports this uh, viral material into the nucleus. And by doing this, you, it won't get in there and it won't replicate, at least ideally that won't. So if you look at some uh, antimicrobial agents, so uh, Bactrim or Septra, that's trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole, and that's a two-step approach. One substitutes for PABA, the other one works on decreasing dihydrofolate reductase, and it works synergistically. So my uh, proposal to anybody who's a remdesivir site is to go to your IRB now and see if you can't add in a arm that would be a placebo versus ivermectin, but both groups getting remdesivir. Because unless we start doing RCTs, as we're seeing with the popular press describing hydroxychloroquine and all this other stuff, we're not gonna get useless, useful data. This may work, it may not work, but I think unless we do it that way, but it kind of makes sense that it might work. And again, what I really like is the safety profile of this one. All right, so basically that leads us to, uh, I guess the, uh, the 800 pound gorilla in the room, as some people might think of it these days, it's getting so much press, uh, hydroxychloroquine. And, and you really the same things here apply. I mean, you know, we, you know we've, we're following this very carefully. We've gone over the paper of the 80 patients from France very carefully. Um, and it really appears that we're just talking about things other than uh, clinical outcomes that are really important to us. We really aren't there yet. Is that, is that your, you, you still in agreement? I, I am. And so if you look at uh, most of these, if not all these studies are looking at nasopharyngeal carriage and uh, viral loads to see how much that people have. With the thought being, which is probably correct, the lower your viral load is, the less you are probably going to infect somebody else. Uh, and that might be a good thing. That'll drive down that r naught. So, but we really have to have to look at this. And if you look at these combinations, and again, just like we talked about the synergism, that's why you have the hydroxychloroquine with the azithromycin and the zinc. And the zinc is thought to work by, again, working with that same polymerase, that RDRP, the zinc makes it inactive so you can't propagate this virus. But uh, we really need to, to study this because a lot of this makes, and this is just pharmacology, a lot of this you can draw a diagram and it makes sense. But when you put it into clinical practice, it doesn't always work out and we need those clinical outcomes. Yeah, and I think it's actually important for us to point out that not only that is that theoretically true, but it's empirically true. I mean, we, we've seen that happen and we've seen it over and over again where we have this in vitro activity and it really looks great uh, and it just, it doesn't, it doesn't work. And so we really have to be mindful of that. And I think there's that big leap that we're still taking there. And that's, that's something that's really kind of scaring me. And, and just to go one step further, Sean, just to round out the discussion, um, I'm sure that people are hearing... Um, you know, on the cable news, if from nowhere else, uh, about prophylaxis, about going into shifts, going into their, uh, and not just for doctors, right? For, 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 for not just for healthcare workers, people talking about prophylaxis on a broad scale uh, with uh, hydroxychloroquine. And uh, boy, oh boy, uh, where do we start? Well, uh, first of all, it's unproven. Number one, it's unproven. And we cannot take this position, well, what's the downside? There's downside. First of all, uh, if it does work for a super sick person, we need to save it for that. But remember, both of these agents, particularly the hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, do prolong your QTC. And if someone else has whatever predisposition for that, congenital long QT they don't know, some other meds that they're on, they might be hypokalemic or hypomagnesemic. And if you're thinking about taking magnesium with this, well, magnesium impairs the absorption of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. So you're not gonna get the dose that you want. So you can't even really treat yourself or pre-treat yourself with the magnesium. So uh, I think this is a, a practice that definitely should be discouraged. We just don't know at this stage. And I think there's true risk with doing it. You know, Dave, I'm gonna pull you in because we were talking about this today and you had the great bleach analogy. Yeah, the great bleach analogy. Right. We know bleach kills viruses, but we, we might not suggest, you know, people swallow it or hang it in an IV to treat somebody. So, I mean, I'm, I mean, could you have picked more obsolete antibiotics um, that were, that were, that were meant for, for other types of antimicrobial purposes? Um, I mean, I think, prior to azithromycin being mentioned as a possible treatment of COVID-19, 
I think doctors had already concluded that it was not active killing bacteria very much. And um, chloroquine, of course, is a nearly obsolete and anti-malarial. Um, ivermectin is still used. Um, you know, I, I guess if we put these all together, we would, um, even if they didn't work, there'd be a lower rate of chlamydia, scabies, river blindness, <laughs> and uh, what else? Arthritis, I guess, too. So I don't know. It, it does seem like a Hail Mary, Sean. I, I agree with you. To try to repurpose these antimicrobials, with, which were developed and designed and do work for, for microbes that have completely different uh, uh, mechanisms of, of growth and reproduction. I'm with you entirely, Dave. I mean, if you look at how it works, uh, I'm talking about uh, ivermectin. It works on a chloride ion channel in non-vertebrate <laughs> right. animal, right? So it's this is not like, oh, it, it uh, just is applying to the same thing. I think we need to be look at these and be done with them because with the popular press just going crazy with this stuff, I think we just need to study it for nothing else to tell the people, to stop it, it doesn't work, and let's move on and look for a novel compound like remdesivir or whatever it is, right? So we got to start with the new, and there might be some old stuff, but most of it, I agree, is not going to work. But, you know, with people just going to whatever social, you know, outlet they want or whatever feeds they're reading. Uh, and then we have some, you know, docs out there that are really making these miracle drug claims that are uh, uh, really unfounded, in my opinion. You know, it's, it's worse than just the QT prolongation and other cardiac effects. We know that in chikungunya, you put uh, a hydroxychloroquine in there and it acts like bleach and it kills all the viruses and then they did it in humans and the humans got worse so uh, this might not just be zero and it might just not be side effect profile it might actually make the people worse that's why it has to be studied what about convalescent sera so um in, we already talked about this a little bit um with uh, with dave uh, talon at the beginning um and uh, the only thing we're going to say is that we hope this works um, and uh, we're excited to be able to report uh, very soon uh, on a couple of uh, our colleagues that have uh, gotten the, uh, emer the releases that they need to get this done, and we're going to be able to report on that within a few days on, on how that's going, and also uh, to tell people how to do it. Uh, one, of our, one of the UCLA grads uh, is going to uh, do a little interview with Mel, and we're going to post that as soon as possible on his experience on how he got this done. Um, and Sean, you're pretty excited about it, aren't you? I am. And this, uh, uh, and I will uh, defer to Dave Talon as well uh, on this, but we have experience with this. I mean, this goes back, you know, to the 1890s or something like that is when this was first used. It's not, uh, you know, going to cure everybody, but it makes uh, a lot of sense. Uh, it works better prophylactically. So those people who are high risk or, you know, early on in disease than the people that are treated. But I think at this stage for those people, this is another Hail Mary day, right? I mean, you have these people and this one case that we'll, we'll hear about is somebody who was on ECMO, multiple pressors, and really had a high mortality probability who, who uh, was given this uh, 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 convalescent serum and hopefully is working for them. Yeah, I think at the last uh, session, we talked about this uh, case series of five patients, uh, which the, it seemed to show based on how sick these people were, they were all mechanically ventilated. Maybe that's what you're referring to. One was on ECMO, is that right? No, this is actually we, uh, uh, one of the UCLA uh, grads, Mike Katz. Do you remember Mike Katz? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Mike Katz, who's a, a EMIM critical care doc. He's a good friend of mine, and he has a patient that he just gave it to who's in the unit, and uh, it seems to be responding well. So we're going to hear from Mike. Right. So we reviewed that small series um, that was published, I think, in JAMA, and it, it looked impressive. Again, there wasn't a control group. We're talking about five people. There is this history that you talk about where it's been used in other types of serious viral illness and it's worked. So, um, you know, I was walking, I'm working at uh, UCLA Ronald Reagan and I, and I stay at a hotel overnight between you know, the days that I work in a row. 
uh, of course, Westwood is a ghost town, so I'm walking mm -hmm. around. Uh, I made the mistake of uh, when I went across the street, pressing that button, you know, to, I, I, where we think we can control that little guy walking, you know, so I pressed it. I'm like, oh my gosh, everybody must have pressed that thing. Now I have to be sure not to touch my face. But as I'm walking through Westwood, I see a blood donation uh, storefront, I guess you call it a store, business, whatever. And then right next to it is a legal marijuana store. And I just wondered, like, you know, if people, you know, got high and then thought, you know, it would be a nice thing to do to donate my serum. Um, maybe for something like this, convalescent serum. I wonder if the person getting it, you're kind of a toxicologist, aren't you? Yeah, I am. The, the THC would, would still be active in their donated blood. I, I, and, and I know this is completely off the subject and we're going to edit this most likely, <laughs> right? <laughs> but I just wondered about that. Let's Not hope it. so. Yeah, I, would, I wouldn't worry about that. I wouldn't worry. There's going to be natural degradation that goes on uh, over time, and they're probably not going to have a concentration that would give them any kind of psychoactive, uh, but it could make them feel better. Well, Dave, if it that doesn't work, like the they'll worst feel way better, to get high right? And the worst <laughs> excuse for when you test positive at work. Right. <laughs> you got a blood donation. Yeah. Yeah. The guy who just smoked weed. It's the convalescent <laughs> serum. I swear it was the convalescent serum. Hey, you heard of medicinal <laughs> marijuana. This is real medicinal marijuana. All right. You see, Swami gets me. You're, the rest of you are like, oh, my God. What's Dave talking about? <laughs> exactly. Well, we're going to keep this moving. Uh, we've got a couple more speakers. So uh, I want to introduce Vanessa Cardi. I think probably uh, everybody on the MRAP universe knows Vanessa. Uh, she um, has been doing the Rural Medicine series on MRAP for a number of years. It's one of the most beloved series, and she's going to give us a quick sort of soliloquy uh, about some of the things you need to think about in low resource settings. And before she starts, just remember that uh, there's low resource and then there's no resource. We're also speaking to some people in Africa where there is basically zero resource. And that's even another story, again, about what you possibly could do to help. So, Vanessa, take it away. All right. Thanks, Mel. And thanks to everyone for listening in. So it seems so far, at least, that the dreaded COVID surge hasn't really hit a lot of rural and remote regions in North America yet, but we're talking to other regions as well. Um, so don't forget that. But also don't let this lull you into a false sense of security because this is coming. And if you're a tertiary care doc as well, don't think that this part of the evening isn't relevant to you because when these rural and remote patients are super sick and need to go to an ICU, they're going to your ICU and they're going to strain your resources, which you just burn through all already during your own search. So trust me, if you haven't already got plans in place for this hitting rural and remote regions, you need to hurry up and get them set up now. Now, one of the challenges that we experience in rural and remote regions is that it often falls on the physicians who are actually practicing to develop the protocols and systems for these emergencies. And in one way, this is great because for sure all the protocols are clinically relevant. Um, so because we're creating them ourselves, but it also puts an extra burden of work on all of us at a time when we're already kind of swamped. For example, I know my colleagues up north right now are basically having to reconfigure our entire hospital, stay abreast with the constant changing information that's coming at all of us. And of course, keep all the regular non-COVID clinical services running. So there's a shout out to them and to anyone else who's dealing with this. So let's talk about planning. So planning and preparation are going to vary a lot depending on where you are. A community hospital that might be considered rural that's only an hour or two away from a city um, you know, is going to have a very different reality than a place that's far more remote where there's only airplane access. Similarly, a lot of your planning is going to depend on your baseline staffing levels. It's important here to think outside the box and perhaps outside what are considered the usual limits of healthcare administration. You may have noticed during pandemics that sort of, you know, the bureaucratic rules get loosened a bit. And so this is one of those times where you can maybe bring in other people from other healthcare administrations adjacent to yours and really try and work together. So try and find out all of the resources that you have available to you in your area. Do a tally of all the physicians and PAs and NPs, dentists, dental hygienists, dental surgeons, all of them, anyone with healthcare experience in your region, and think how you can actually use them. Put out a call for any janitorial staff from schools and government buildings that aren't being used at the moment, restaurants even, because these guys could, be, because these guys could be your backup cleaning teams. 
and think about what retraining everyone might need and try and get it done now before the surge hits. And also you need to set up call systems for first wave and second waves of the illness. Because what happens in a lot of these situations is, you know, there's a big disaster, everyone rushes in to help and then people start to get sick or they get exposed and there's questions over whether it need to be in isolation. So then you start losing staff and we need to make sure that we have waves of people who are ready to take on the different um, time peaks in this epidemic. So in an effort to help people save a bit of time and energy for all those rural and remote docs out there who are working and trying to do all this themselves, I want to share a document with you. And it's going to be shared on the site and it's going to be shared on the uh, YouTube link. It was created by colleagues of mine who have experience in disaster zones and disease outbreaks and who also work in the north of Canada. Now you're going to see when you look at it that it's based on their clinic and their nursing station, which only has two little crash rooms and no admission capability, but it sets up all of the key principles that you need, really need to remember. Principles like making a hot zone and a cold zone, making sure that the hot zone can gradually be expanded as cases increase, making sure that people are being triaged effectively, but also really importantly, that they're being pre-triaged effectively before they get into the building. Because if you have a tiny little building, you've got to make sure that these patients are going to a dedicated area if you think they might have COVID. And you really want to make sure that the paths of COVID and non-COVID patients do not cross. And if you've got a small building, this can be a lot harder. It also addresses the all important issues of communication, like how to communicate with your teams and your administration, but also, also the local community. And it's a really great resource and the authors have given us permission to share the link. And so we're gonna do that. And so hopefully that will maybe cut down some of the legwork that you have to do. Another thing I wanted to talk about was resource allocation. Now, a lot of attention is being paid to the availability of ventilators and how this is going to limit our options, not only in the big cities, but certainly in many small rural and remote regions. And this is definitely true, but there are a lot of other more even immediate factors that could cause the remote systems to completely collapse if we get a true surge of really ill COVID patients. One example is lack of oxygen. I know it might sound odd to say this because we are clearly surrounded by oxygen, but you need a way of packaging that oxygen. So you need to actually think of how you're going to stockpile this or at least plan for higher burn rates. And this is a really serious consideration. I know at my own institution, we have run critically low on oxygen supplies in the past, and that was not during a respiratory pandemic. Pandemic. So this is something you need to think about. Medications, or medications as well are something that we're talking about, just as uh, Stuart and Sean were mentioning. Um, there, you know, we're starting to worry that we're going to run out of some of these meds. And even if we're no longer advocating the early intubation as the main airway management, these patients who have, you know, critically ill, these critically ill patients with COVID, they still need a lot of our commonly used analgesics, anxiolytics, and sedatives. The same meds that we use for procedural sedations, shocky patients, and you know, our palliative care patients who come into the eMERGE. So we need to get comfortable about using our third and fourth line meds for those other sort of more minor procedures and perhaps some of the palliative care patients and thinking of ways to preserve our stocks for the sickest of the sick. For example, for palliative patients or for even for procedures, you can try intranasal or topical ketamine. Think about methotrimeprazine if, for agitation if you have it. I know I don't think it's available in the US, but talk to your pharmacy, come up with a plan. And then, of course, there's the issue of PPE. Do you have enough now? Do you have a way of replacing it? And if you cannot keep your workers safe, is it ethical to send them into a room full of COVID? Now, there are no straightforward answers to this, and I'm not pretending to have the answers, but this is something that is going to be a lot easier for you all to deal with if you've talked through scenarios ahead of time. And finally, I wanted to talk about um, corridors of care, because I really want to make sure that anyone in the remote and rural regions are out there are keeping in close contact with their referral centers. Most small or remote shops are not going to be able to admit COVID patients if they need much more than observation. So you need to think about where they're going to go and how they're going to get there. Now, this might seem obvious, but in many places around the world, our rural hospitals are kind of out there on their own and don't automatically belong to a set corridor of care. So try to work with the teams there what your regional approach is going to be. You have to decide, are all COVID patients going to be sent to one or two specialized centers, which I know is happening in some regions? Try and concentrate the expertise, try and concentrate the equipment, but still you still have to get them from your hospital out to the bigger cities. And then also, are they going to be sending COVID patients who are palliative to those centers? Are you going to keep them in your own institutions? And are those patients going to travel alone? Are they going to be able to have visitors when they're in these bigger cities? These are all things you have to think about and talk through with your patients. And when it comes to the transfers, how are you going to get the patients out of your center? Are they going by road, by plane, or helicopter? 
and how is the mode of transportation going to affect their clinical situation? Because we might be allowing permissive hypoxia in these like highly monitored ER situations, but what about when they get into a fixed wing plane and now they're at 20,000 feet? Or what about proning people when they're intubated? Have you ever tried doing that on a plane? I haven't. I really don't hope, I really hope I don't have to. Um, but these are all things to think about. And also, thinking about how long will planes and ambulance rigs and teams be out of service after they've done one transfer, because all of these things have to be disinfected, refueled, and sent off again. And I really wasn't trying to scare the rural and remote docs out there. I know you've got this, but I just want to remind you that you're not alone, that there are rural docs everywhere all over the world who are going through the same thing, and we're all here to help each other. So reach out, because we're here. Thanks. It's, uh, there's some really great ideas there. I know that Ken Milmer is going to um, do a, a, maybe a breaking news segment later in the week about this. He's got some other ideas as well. So uh, thanks for that. I know that in the in my friends that are in zero resource settings are talking about things like taking all the old people and the people that are at highest risk and putting them over in that part of the village. And they are going to get completely cordoned off from the young and healthy people and there'll be some way to exchange food and do stuff and that's all they can do. That's, that's uh, the maximum that they can do. So thanks very much for your time, Vanessa, and we'll um, put all of those links on uh, the, the, the COVID section of the website. So I wanna bring in Sarah Crager now and uh, get her to give us some updates. We talked to Sarah last week and since then she's probably quadrupled her experience. So uh, Sarah, can you first sort of tell us about this permissive uh, hypoxemia, is that still the way to go? What's the current thinking in the uh, community of critical care peeps? Yeah, so um, I think that things are maybe starting to crystallize a little bit, but I think that it's going to be a bit by bit thing rather than a massive epiphany that next week we'll suddenly know what's happening with this disease. Um, I think that now as such is a time that we all really need to think about the, I think Cliff Reed was the one who coined this concept, the idea of unlearning. We all really want to latch on to something that, aha, this is how it works. This is what you do. We know what's happening. The problem is we need to be thoughtful and flexible as we go through this process because what was true last week and what we thought last week, the theory last week might be totally wrong this week. And I think the way that we're gonna to get to where we need to get is an iterative process of integrating new data, cumulative experience, and then that'll allow us to slowly develop these new theories. Um, so I think we need to be patient and we need to be flexible. That being said, um, over the last sort of week ish, a couple of themes seem to be emerging um, from the sort of critical care discussion um, in my discussions with other people in reading the literature that's coming out. And there was a really, really useful paper that came out um, published by uh, some of the Italian guys that was very impressive. Um, not on the data and this number shows that this many patients did this, but basically saying, we've seen a lot of these patients. This is what we think based on careful observation and our cumulative experience. So for me, the themes that have really emerged, there's four of them. One is that it's becoming clearer and clearer that we're really probably talking about two subtypes here, which we have Christian Day type L and a type H. The second theme is that these subtypes may in fact be on a continuum with a transition point that occurs quite abruptly, implying some kind of vicious cycle that snowballs. Theme three is that intubation timing and triggers probably should be less about hypoxia and more about work of breathing. And theme four is the idea of buying time. So I think that theme one, what's become interesting is that if you look at different patients, either two different patients who seem to have different clinical subtypes or the same patient when they initially come in and then maybe a week or two later, what you'll see is both patients, both subtypes can have similar degrees of hypoxia. The difference between these two subtypes is not that one is so much more hypoxic than the other one. It's that they're both hypoxic, but their imaging looks totally different and their lungs are behaving totally different, suggesting that even though the hypoxia may be equivalent in both, both categories of patients, the reason for it is not the same. So the type L patients that we're calling the type L patients, um, those patients are the ones who actually, their lungs are acting pretty good. They have good compliance. 
um, they may have some VQ matching problems, and there's a lot of theories about maybe that's one of the core pathophysiologic things that's going on here. On imaging, their lungs don't look horrific. They have some grand glass opacities, but they're not those horrible looking chest x-rays. Um, and they actually don't have a ton of alveolar collapse, so they're probably not going to get better. Their hypoxia is not going to get better by recruiting them. Those are the type L patients. That's one phenotype that we're seeing. Then we have the type H patients. And the type H patients, those guys basically look more like the ARDS we all know and love. They have poor oxygenation, but it's going on with poor compliance, this worsening interstitial pulmonary edema on top of the ground glass opacities on imaging, the usual physiology of ARDS, including the way to get their oxygenation better may be to recruit some more lung, because these patients often may, like the ARDS patients, have a lot of alveolar collapse. So what then becomes interesting is that these subtypes may be on a continuum. Right? Like it's not just that like if you have X gene in this immune system, it'll be type H. If you have this other one, it'll be type L. Because what we're seeing is that some patients, in fact, maybe many patients even, show up with type L, but then they progress to type H. But the interesting part there is, but not always. And so if they always progress to type H, then we don't have that much to work with. We're just like, okay, it's a bad disease. But if some patients come in, they start with one type that is easier to work with, easier to treat, and then it changes, but not always, not in all patients, maybe that means there's something we can do about it. The other thing that we're noticing in these patients is that the transition seems to be quite abrupt. These are why we keep saying, oh, intubate early, intubate early, because when they crump, they crump hard and fast. So the transition seems to be abrupt, which as we talked about last week, is making a lot of us think that something is going on here. There's some kind of vicious cycle that snowballs, causing these patients to fall off the cliff. And so there's a theory that's going around about this um, based on some things we know and some things we're just theorizing. So here's what we know. We know about lungs that both excessive negative pressure and positive pressure ventilation can both independently cause lung injury, even to healthy lungs. If you take totally normal lungs and expose them to either excessive negative pressure or excessive positive pressure, you end up with very unhappy injured lungs. So we know that already. But the way that that plays in is here's a candidate theory that's being floated. People are wondering if a possible key feature of this disease, of that sort of process of transitioning between the type L and the type H, may be this idea of self-inflicted lung injury. What do we mean by that? Well, the idea is that maybe what these patients are doing, they come in, they're super hypoxic, they're breathing at a rate of 35, they're taking these huge tidal volumes, and maybe they're generating these very negative intrathoracic pressures combined with high tidal volumes, which we also know is bad for lungs, and then the combination of these very negative inspiratory intrathoracic pressures and the high tidal volumes now put in the context if you're already taking lungs that have a viral pneumonia, the lungs aren't happy to begin with, all of this together snowballs into increased lung permeability, increased inflammation, interstitial lung edema. You know what that makes the patient do? They feel more short of breath. Oh, they breathe more, they breathe faster, they try and breathe deeper. And so maybe that's something that can be causing this vicious cycle. The other thing that may be causing it is us. I mean, we, for lots of good reasons at the time, we're intubating so many of these patients that were just hypoxic. It turns out we know that positive pressure, that like us inflicted lung injury, is not so great for lungs either when we do it with a vent. And so how might this play out? How might this theory match up with what we're seeing clinically? One of the things that I'm wondering is maybe it goes something like this. They start out with this viral pneumonia picture. And for some reason that we don't yet understand, this particular disease causes this combination where you get profound hypoxia, but unlike usual, that profound hypoxia is actually not associated with decreased compliance, which is something that's totally tripping all the intensivists out because normally the same things that cause hypoxia cause essentially proportionately decreased compliance. We're used to these two things going together. But the thing is that normally when you have a profoundly hypoxic patient who has ARDS, they have terrible compliance. And so maybe it's the case that those usual ARDS patients with poor oxygenation, but also poor compliance, 
maybe they just can't really self-inflict that much lung injury on themselves because you can't generate that much negative pressure because their lungs are so stiff. Or, and, they just end up crumping before they even have the chance to do that. The object lesson there is what happened in the ARDS story is that we would intubate those patients probably for good reason. However, we then promptly proceeded to give them positive pressure lung injury because we didn't know how to ventilate them. Certainly could be happening something along those lines with these COVID patients. Um, so what does that mean clinically for us? What does this mean for you tomorrow? I think the big thing for me is this third theme that what is our intubation timing and what should our trigger be? Because I think so many of us are struggling with this from so many different ways. And I think what's emerging is that it's about the work of breathing, not the O2 sac. And that, you know, in this paper, um, it's, it's very interesting because what the authors say when they talk about intubation triggers is they don't say at this SAT or this oxygen requirement, go ahead and intubate the patient. They actually give numbers for triggers. Their numbers are work of breathing numbers. So they say, you know, we don't recommend prompt intubation at X, Y, and Z, O2 SAT, but at a given value on an esophageal pressure manometry which is basically an objective test of work of breathing. Now, I don't know about you guys, I don't usually carry an esophageal pressure manometry monitor in my pocket. Just, you know, most of us probably don't. Certainly we're not doing this in the emergency department. Um, so I think the substitute for that is the eyeball test for work of breathing, which fortunately is something that we all can do. As ER physicians, we're really good at the eyeball test for work of breathing. I think though that we're getting fooled because that O2 sat is just really jarring us. And so what I've started doing with these patients is literally and figuratively blinding myself to the O2 sat. Like just like not looking at the monitor first, not looking at the O2 sat. I don't want to know. Just look at the patient without that piece of information because that is going to bias me. I want to look at the patient first and then look at the number. And so that's one of the things that I'm thinking about as I'm trying to figure out the implications for these patients. Um, the last thing, the fourth theme, is this idea of buying time. So we have all been sitting around trying to figure out what's the disease process, is there a magic bullet? Right now, all we can say is that we just need to give the patients time for this disease process to run its course. But basically, what we want to do is buy time for the disease process to run its course, but in a way that causes the least amount of additional damage to the lungs possible, caveat, while still keeping the patient's oxygenation at levels that are compatible with life. So I think that this is going to be a very tricky process because we all want a magic bullet. We all want a drug that is magically going to fix this. But I think it's just gonna be more complicated than that. I think that really optimal treatment for these patients might just be old school style, being thoughtful about the pathophysiology and tailoring your treatment to the individual patient and then watching them very carefully as that pathophysiology changes over time. And I think that you know, just as it's dangerous to extrapolate too much from the ARDS literature, I think it may also be dangerous to try and extrapolate too literally from the HAPE literature, for example, because people are saying, oh, maybe this is more like HAPE. We just don't know, but I think that is us trying to find an easy magic bullet solution. We already have the drugs for HAPE, we know how to treat it, great, good, give some acetylazolamide, call it a day. But maybe it's just not that simple. So I think for me, the bottom line is, when I am looking at these patients, if I have a type L patient who is nice lung compliance, they're coming in, they're profoundly hypoxic, but they're not having increased work of breathing. On the eyeball test, they're telling me they're not having increased work of breathing. Give them some oxygen. Nothing fancy. We're not talking about high flow here yet. We're not talking about CPAP, but give them some oxygen. Reverse their hypoxemia to some level. But I've gotten to be pretty open to what level that is and much more interested in how comfortable the patient looks. So can I give you a magic number of hypoxia where like intubate them now, but not this other time? No. Um, but, you know, give them some oxygen, not too much, something enough. Now, when they develop increased work of breathing, as many of them do, now is the time to find something that will help decrease their work of breathing because it's the work of breathing itself that may be doing them some damage. 
And so they actually, people increasingly are saying high flow nasal cannula, like Swami was saying, CPAP, and doing these things in a way not to make the numbers pretty. We're not trying to make the oxygenation numbers beautiful. We're not trying to make the numbers beautiful. We're just trying to literally make the patient comfortable. And so that is maybe one of the things you can do there. And so when we're talking about making a patient comfortable on CPAP, we're not talking about, you know, an EPAP of 18 and an IPAP of 24. We're just not. And so the people who are doing this are talking about a CPAP of five, something like that. Then the last sort of thing that brings it together is, let's say you've done all that. You gave them some oxygen. They were still having increased work of breathing and your interventions to try and decrease their work of breathing are just not working. Now, people are thinking that is your trigger for intubation because if your patient is having prolonged period where they have severely increased work of breathing, maybe that is what's really propagating this vicious cycle where that severe increased work of breathing causes them, they feel more short of breath, they start taking even deeper breaths, trying to generate more negative pressure. And so maybe that is the time to intubate when the patient really is genuinely having increased work of breathing sort of independent of the O2 sac. So everything I said may not be true next week. We don't know. But I think that these are some of the themes that are beginning to emerge over time, not just sort of one patient thought this and a blog post said this that one time and one paper said one thing about this, but themes that multiple people are noticing. And so I think that's what's emerging now. And we'll see how these things develop over time, what new things come up. But I think, again, as this evolves, we all need to be flexible and we all need to remember this sort of unlearning principle that just because something was true this week doesn't mean it hasn't evolved and you can probably do some harm to people by doing things that we should have unlearned. That's uh, great. Swami, you wanted to make a comment? Yeah, I mean, first of all, Sarah, that flexibility idea is so critical here because things changing so rapidly. And I think that with, especially with that L type, the patients who come in hypoxic, but they're speaking to you, their respiratory rates are high. I think it's hard to judge the work of breathing because some of these patients are coming in with a respiratory rate of 40. They look like they're taking yeah. relatively shallow breaths. Their SAT is 75, 80%. And all of our lives as emergency physicians, that patient gets intubated. And now we're having to switch that tact. Mm -hmm. I think supplying a small amount of positive pressure can really help those patients with that work of breathing. The hard part is judging, like you said, when to intubate. And I think that as we're getting younger and younger patients that I'm seeing, they can maintain that respiratory rate for a long time. And so our trigger has moved from the respiratory rate and the oxygen saturation to altered mental status, uh, mm -hmm. rising PCO2s if we happen to be getting ABGs, which I don't get a lot of those, and somnolence. If they become altered, they weren't altered when they got to you and now they are, they're becoming more fatigued. Those are our cues that we got to take over that airway. But supplying that little bit of positive pressure, I think we made this mistake two weeks ago. We were giving them a couple of liters nasal cannula, non-rebreather, and then right to intubation and skipping the high flow and the CPAP mm -hmm. because we were so worried about aerosolization and our exposure. And I think we have to move away from that a little bit and find more protected ways to give them that or protect ourselves walking around in, in maximal PPE all day and basically, you know, allowing aerosolization to happen because it will stave off the intubation. And, you know, when you get to levels where 95% of your ventilators are used, all of a sudden you start saying CPAP and high flow nasal cannula sound like good ideas. But I think if we shift and do that a little bit earlier, we can prevent that saturation of vents and saturation of ICU. I think there's a lot of great stuff we discussed in there. And you're right. I mean, in a week, we might be talking about different things, but I think it's starting to come together a little bit, which is reassuring. And I, I feel like the experiences of the frontline docs in New York are, are going to make their way out to other places so that you guys can start there and then refine yeah. that even better. Exactly. And I think it's been super helpful for me just to compare notes with people in New York and other people who are taking care of these patients to sort of say, what's a blip? What's a trend? What's a pattern? What's not? What are you seeing? What am I seeing? I would say that what I've been doing is asking the patient, just sort of essentially being like, do you feel tired? Because I think that at least with the theory that we're throwing around now, that subjective sensation of dyspnea 
is actually really important because that might be the thing that maybe causes this visual cycle to really get out of hand. When the patient starts feeling more dysmic, now they're trying to take even bigger breaths, generate even more negative pressure, and then maybe that's the thing that tips us over. I don't know. But I found it interesting because, you know, as we've said, a lot of these patients come in and their self-report of how they're feeling totally doesn't correlate with their, with their O2 sat. And you're looking at their sat and the patient's sitting there like texting, being like, no, I'm fine, all good. Um, but what I have found is that, and it's sort of going along with the mental status that you said, I just ask them pretty frequently and you know, have nurses screening patients and just sort of being like, do you feel like you're short of breath? And anecdotally, at least, that has been, for me, a pretty good trigger where I've managed to intubate these patients without having a total disaster crump crashing intubation where they tank their sats. Again, one other next thing, week. Yeah, one other thing I wanted to add, Sarah, is, and I wasn't doing this early, but we're starting to do it more now. A lot of these patients are getting pretty significant pleurisy and they're getting a lot of pleuritic yeah. chest pain and they're guppy breathing. They're taking these little shallow breaths, yeah. not because they can't, but because they're in so much pain and adding a little, yeah, adding a little analgesic might go a long way. And this is really hard because you don't want to do give respiratory suppression by giving opiates. When the beginning we were told not to use NSAIDs, we're using NSAIDs. Uh, I think a, a, a dose of Ketorolac can actually help quite a bit here. And um, haloperidol is another one. As long as we're not adding the hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, azithromycin with the haloperidol, prolonging that QTC and making Sean's brain explode, I think it's another way to maybe mitigate some of that pain without respiratory depression. Low-dose ketamine is another thing that, that we're reaching for more frequently. So um, ask the patient, are you breathing that way because it hurts? Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of patients are getting pleurisy. And talking to some of the uh, EM docs that we had on a couple of weeks ago that have recovered now, they all complained of significant pleurisy with their, um, mm -hmm. with their COVID symptoms. So it's something else to think about. Interesting. And also, if we're trying to base so much of this on clinical gestalt of work of breathing to try and parse out those two variables is the patient, because we all know if a patient is in pain from anything, their breathing is not necessarily normal. And so to try and simplify our lives to take that other variable out, I think that's a really, really good idea. I like it. Sarah, I want to hit you with a couple of uh, questions slash statements, and um, you can tell me what's wrong, what's right. First of all, um, Apparently, I missed this memo, but it used to be that uh, not long ago, you intensivists were saying that a saturation of 88, 86 is fine. Um, now I hear you guys talking about, oh, if we get them to 92-ish, we're kind of happy. What happened? Yeah, so um, a paper at a sort of inconvenient time, because this paper actually just came out in March of 2020. Um, there was a paper, it came out, I believe, New England Journal, um, and it was looking at what they're calling a liberal or conservative oxygen therapy. So I sort of suspect that what was happening here is that the initial papers about oxygen strategies for ARDS and critically ill patients did the following. They would compare patients who were getting FiO2s of 100 and their SATs were always 100 and their PaO2s were 250, basically really aggressive oxygen, with a permissive hypoxemia strategy where they'd be like 88 to 92 is okay. In those studies, it seemed like 88 to 92 was okay. Subsequently, what we've realized is those studies probably didn't show that 88 to 92 percent was good. It probably showed that 97 to 100 percent was bad. And so I think there was a lot of confusion over that because now we know that too much oxygen is probably very bad for critically ill patients. Too much oxygen is definitely bad for the lungs. And so that's probably what happened there. So then subsequently, we've been trying to figure out, okay, if we maybe didn't really show that 88 to 92 is the right number, we just showed that 100% is the wrong number, what is the right number? So in the New England Journal, just literally, I think, March, um, a article came out that was looking at liberal or conservative oxygen strategies. And what they're meant by liberal or conservative now is very different. So basically, they compared the 88 to 92 in to a like 92 to 96. And the study was stopped early. The methodology was interesting, um, not perfect, but there was definitely some, it seemed like some true signal that maybe 92 to 96 may be better for mortality than 88 to 92. So that's what changed, is that we realized that what we thought before, we sort of had it backwards and our interpretation of the studies before was a little bit backwards. And so that's why we're saying this. But again, keep in mind, 
all of this literature is in the ARDS literature for the most part. And as I just said, I think that we have to be very careful about extrapolating too much from the ARDS literature or any other lung disease literature, because thus far, this isn't really behaving like anything else we know. Yeah, that is a good point, and we won't for a while, but I thought the entire critical care community turned into wimps, and I was just like, <laughs> come on, what happened? Um, we asked this last week. I don't think we got a good answer, but I think you've got a better answer for us now. Are these sets real? Um, when you do an ABG at the same time, do they correlate? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the first few patients I saw like this, I actually put in A-lines because I was like, I don't know, what am I, is there something with the hemoglobin, what's happening? Um, and so once I started doing that, it became clear that yes, they correlate with the ABG, they are real. I mean, I can't say that there's no degree of hemoglobinopathy and there's not something else going on here, but it's not like I'll see them satting 75 and their PaO2 is actually 100. Um, that hasn't been happening. So, yeah. There's a subset of these patients that are, you know, inflammatory, prothrombotic, it appears, and have lots and lots of tiny PEs in their lungs. Are you peeps thinking about anticoagulating all these people or just if you see it on CT or give us some guidance? Yeah, so I wish I could give you definitive and clear guidance. Um, I think that we don't quite know yet, or certainly I don't quite know yet. I think that the bottom line is for these patients, this is the time to do good prophylactic anticoagulation of Lovenox um, and make sure to start it immediately when they get admitted. This is not the time to forget about that. Um, and I think you know, Lovenox is probably better than heparin just because you're, it's gonna be more consistent. So I think definitely for that, I would just do good prophylactic, make sure you're vigilant about it. In terms of systemically anticoagulating patients, I know there are some people that are doing that. I think that it may be the right thing in some situations, but probably not in all patients. And I would go back to what is the specific pathophysiology that my patient is having? And do I think that all these microemboli causing profound dead space ventilation may be causing some of my patient's issues? Because I also have had patients who initially had gone from this sort of hypocarpic picture, which we're seeing initially in a lot of these patients, that their CO2 is actually quite low, lower than normal. And then later, later in their disease course, I'm now seeing this like, oh, their minute ventilation on the vent is great, but their CO2 is still high. What's going on here? So I think that is going to have to be addressed on the individual patient level. And it's really hard with this disease. It's just so diverse to say everybody should do this for everybody. Got it. I want to um, let people know that Sarah's working on a uh, vent basics um, because apparently um, some of us might have to be running vents and we haven't done that in a long time. So that should be coming soon. Swatted, um, let's have you. Uh, thanks very much, Sarah. Um, if you can come back next week and tell us, you know, your, your new theory, that would be great uh, because this is changing so fast and we are starting to get the Italian data and we'll be getting New York data as the critical care people hopefully soon will be able to take a breath. Um, that would be great if you could come back and chat with us some more. So let's uh, have Stuart take us through um, some more cardiac stuff. All right, so uh, just, uh, you know, it's uh, getting late. We've been here a while. I just have a couple of uh, updates. Uh, we talked a week ago about people coming in with appendicitis and going home with antibiotics. We talked about uh, cardiologists not uh, wanting to activate the cath lab and recommending lytics. So this is something that obviously we're following very carefully. Um, and so this uh, slide, this is from the Cardiovascular Angiography and Interventions uh, Society, uh, SCAI, just a few uh, couple of weeks ago. And you can see that in their, it's, I'll call this a position paper. They're basically making two important points. Uh, the first one that you can see is that patients should go to the cat lab. Uh, and that really is the, the, uh, the general uh, guidance. Uh, but, and I think, and I'm actually, to be honest, I, I, I'm, I'm on the same page here uh, with that second underlying point, number three, which is starting to open up the possibility um, of being a little more flexible at who you're giving uh, you know, a code STEMI, who you're taking to the cath lab and who you're just giving lytics. And to be honest with you, um, you know, when you're looking at some of these patients, you know, uh, a 75 year old female with uh, an isolated inferior with no right ventricular involvement, you know, 
places where we know the mortality is getting to be less than 1% as it is, um, it's going to get hard to justify some of these interventions. And I think, frankly, this is how it is in most places. <laughs> That's the thing, is that uh, this, this, would, this effectively would take us from an American paradigm to a global paradigm in terms of who we actually take to the cath lab, if you really think about it, because some of these patients probably uh, could do quite well with lytics, especially under these circumstances. So uh, Amol was on a special call today that brought together uh, members of uh, several organizations, and the AHA, ACC, is working on uh, you know, the official uh, recommendations, and they're looking at this, uh, and it apparently it's quite, you know, it's quite a, a heated discussion, and uh, they're going to be working on it through the weekend, hoping to get something in print by next week. And so if that happens, uh, and Amo will be joining us next week, we'll actually present that. Um, but right now, this is sort of the direction that things seem to be moving to give us a little bit of leeway. You know, a, again, a 45-year-old comes in with a new onset left bundle branch block and a Levine sign. I think we have to appreciate in this circumstance, it's a lot different uh, than a 75-year-old patient that's had, you know, grumbling symptoms uh, on and off for a little while uh, with an inferior. You know, I think that we've got to appreciate that those are probably different in this circumstance. So more on that next week. So it took a, a pandemic to get us to treat uh, <laughs> cardiology patients in the way everybody else does, the right way? A little less <laughs> catheterization, let's just say. A little less, a fewer, a fewer less caths. Right. Well, I uh, want to thank you all for playing. Uh, we'll end it here. Um, obviously, we had some technical difficulties, and we'll work on those with Zoom and YouTube over uh, the next week because a big part of this is uh, the chatting that everybody gets to sort of decompress and stuff. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't do that this time, but uh, a tremendous amount of useful information. And I say it every week. I keep thinking, oh, there'll be nothing to talk about next week because we'll know what's happening. But um, uh, that's wrong. That's ignorant. And I'm sorry. I'm going to stop saying that. <laughs> so uh, thanks to everybody. And we will talk to you all next week. Thank you, everybody. See ya.